All right, so in this video, I want to talk about well-formed formulas. And in doing so, there are a few topics that I want to cover. So I've laid out a bit of a roadmap here for us to follow. Uh, I want to talk about variables, and then we'll get to like what the formation rules are. And uh, I find that the formation rules have a tendency of being just a little abstract. So I want to end today's video by bringing things back to natural language English, uh, just to help us better understand what the formation rules are trying to say. So okay, just to get started, what is a well-formed formula? In statement logic, or sentence logic, or propositional logic, or whatever it is that your professors prefer to call it, uh, a well-formed formula is just a grammatical sentence, right? So just like how in English you have the rules of grammar, right? The rules that tell you where commas and periods go and what it means for a sentence to be a properly formed sentence, you also have rules in statement logic that tell you what makes for a well-formed sentence within that logical system. Uh, the difference between natural language English and the rules of, of grammar and the rules in statement logic is that the rules in statement logic are far less forgiving, right? So in English, it's okay if you misplace a comma, we'll still be able to understand what you're saying, right? Uh, but sentence logic, you have to get the rules exactly right. You need to always make sure that the statements that you've written out are written exactly the way that they're supposed to be written. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to do anything with those statements. Okay, so before we get to the formation rules, it'll be valuable to talk about variables. So you may notice that your professors use the uh, lowercase letters a through z to write out their variables. So here's all a variable is, right? So a variable is just supposed to represent a well-formed formula, right? So these variables represent any and all well-formed formulas. Uh, really important thing to note about these, variables are not actually part of statement logic. These exist solely for our convenience, right? So if you're writing a proof or if you're uh, writing out a truth table or a truth tree or what have you, you're always going to use the capital letters, right? Which those are part of the vocabulary of statement logic. And I uploaded a video on the vocabulary of statement logic, so feel free to take a look at that if you haven't uh, watched that before. It'll, it'll help you out with this stuff. Uh, but these lowercase letters are actually not like those, right? They don't actually play into statement logic. They're not a part of it. Rather, we use these to make our lives much easier when we're learning things about statement logic. So for instance, when we're learning about the formation rules, we're going to write those out in terms of these uh, lowercase letters. Also, when you're learning about uh, the, the uh, de derivation rules for proofs or when you're learning about how it is that you're truth functional connectives work in truth tables. We'll do all of those things with lowercase letters. Uh, so that's, that's all these are for. These are just to make our lives easier. They aren't actually a part of the language itself. And every single one of these lowercase letters stands for a well-formed formula. So let's go ahead and talk about the formation rules so we can actually start to uh, sink our teeth into something. So I'm gonna erase this. So we'll start off with the most basic formation rule. Uh, and actually, before we even do that, very briefly, I'm going to write out uh, some of the vocabulary of statement logic, right? So you'll remember that you have the capital letters A through Z. Each one of these stands for an atomic st uh, statement in statement logic, right? And you also have your connectives. So you have the tilde, you have the dot, you have the V, you have the arrow, and you have the double-headed arrow right? And these stand for respectively uh, not, and, or, if, then, if, and only if. I'll have future videos on that as well. Okay, so this is the vocabulary, right? And the thing that really matters for this first rule is the statement letters. It tells us every statement letter is a well-formed formula. So any given individual statement letter will count automatically as a well-formed formula. So A is a well-formed formula, B is a well-formed formula, Z is a well-formed formula, and everything in between. To put this in terms of variables, right, all this means is that you could use a variable to represent any single one of these individual statements, right? Because again, a variable is just going to stand for any well-formed formula whatsoever. These are well-formed formulas. Therefore, a variable can stand for any one of these, right? And it's convention to start with the letter P, 
just because. It's just a convention. You could use lowercase a if you want, what have you, right? Uh, but these would all be appropriate things for these variables to stand for. Okay, so with that written down, our next formation rule says if P is a well formed formula, then not P is a well formed formula. So uh, if P is a well formed formula, then not P is a well formed formula. Right, you can put the tilde right before it, and both of these will be well-formed formulas. So what we've learned, right, is for instance, let's say that P stands for A, right? Uh, then not A would also be a well-formed formula, right? If you have B, not B would be a well-formed formula, right? Now notice because we've learned that these are well-formed formulas, this rule tells us, right, that P could stand for this, right? So P might represent not A. And so if P is a well-formed formula, then you can always add a negation to it, right? So this would also be a well-formed formula, right? And you can actually add as many negations before that as you want. However, you certainly could never do that, right? Don't put a negation after a statement letter. That wouldn't count, right? Uh, okay, so I'm going to write out the rest of the rules because they're all actually quite similar. Uh, so let's see. If P and Q are well-formed formulas, then so are P and uh, P conjunction Q, P disjunction Q, P arrow Q, and P double-headed arrow Q. Those are all of the formation rules. So all of this is telling us, right, these various ones, is that if you have P as a well-formed formula, remember, we stand for any well-formed formulas at all, and if you have Q as a well-formed formula, then you can hook these up with any of these connectives to create another well-formed formula, right? So you can put a dot between them, and that P dot Q would also be a well-formed formula. P V Q would also be a well-formed formula. P arrow Q would be a well-formed formula. P double-headed arrow Q would be a well-formed formula. With these, you can construct any well-formed formula in statement logic, right? So these are all of the rules that you need. All right, so one last thing to say about these formation rules, and that is I've noticed in some textbooks that sometimes these will be portrayed with parentheses around them. I believe this varies by the, uh, by the book. I prefer not to do that, right? It's not because this is incorrect, it's actually quite the contrary, uh, this is all perfectly correct, but it's because I don't think that this really conveys what the point of the parentheses uh, is supposed to be. Parentheses exist in statement logic to get rid of ambiguity, right? In fact, without parentheses, you're going to end up with a lot of statements that are not well-formed formulas because every single statement to be a well-formed formula uh, and here, of course, I'm mostly concerned with compound statements, um, needs to be not ambiguous. So if there's any ambiguity whatsoever in a statement, you do not have a well-formed formula. Ambiguity will get in the way of truth evaluation, which is something that we'll cover in a later video when, we, when I start talking about truth tables. So let me just show you what I mean with a real-world example. In the U.S., it's uh, quite common to be asked for identification when you're going to get certain documents and whatnot, right? Or when you're going to go do something. Uh, and oftentimes, when, so I think, uh, for instance, if you're going to get your passport, you need to present a certain uh, arrangement of legal documents. And oftentimes, the requirement will be written like this. You'll see something that says, you must bring your driver's license and social security social security card or birth certificate and this has always frustrated me because it's a deeply ambiguous sentence, right? It's not really clear what it is that they want from you. 
because they, this could mean one of two things, right? So they might want you to bring your driver's license and your social security, or otherwise, if you don't bring those two, you can bring your birth certificate. Or they might mean that you have to bring your driver's license no matter what, and you can then choose between your social security uh, or your birth certificate. That's deeply ambiguous. This needs some parentheses, right? If we were to write this out in statement logic, parentheses would really help disambiguate this. So here, is, here are the statement letters that I would use to represent this, right? So D, right, for driver's license and social security or birth certificate. This is not a well-formed formula. It needs parentheses in order to disambiguate what's being expressed. You may write this either like this or like this in order to get a well-formed formula. Now realize I'm not telling you, uh, I don't really know what it is that the government wants from us when it comes to this uh, you know, set of requirements here. It'd be nice if they specified, right? The only, the only thing that I'm expressing here is that only things like this count as well-formed formulas. So when it comes to parentheses, you have to make sure that you don't just have a bunch of statement letters hooked up by logical connectives and no parentheses anywhere. If you have only two statement letters with a single logical connective, that's fine. There's no need for parentheses. So this is just as okay as this, right? Those would be fine if that's your entire expression. But if you have more statement letters, if you have more uh, atomic statement letters, you're going to have to add some parentheses somewhere in order to disambiguate. And this actually brings me to the last thing that I want to talk about, which is natural language. These rules are abstract. And what I mean by that is we're talking about P's and Q's and, and the letters and, and these dots and V's and stuff. And that's just not how we're used to thinking, right? We, we tend to think in natural language. And I think it's quite common uh, and, and understandable that professors in these logic classrooms will try to divorce the natural language from, the, you know, from what's going on in the formal system. There's a reason for that. The formal system is not natural language. But it's also worth remembering what it is that the formal system is trying to do. The formal system is trying to represent something in natural language. So when you're writing down your symbols, keep that natural language in mind. For instance, you would never say something like this in natural language, right? You wouldn't say, let's say that A stands for uh, it's raining, right? You wouldn't say it's raining not. Right? You would say, it's not raining. Right? So this is the correct way of doing it. That's not correct. Right? You also wouldn't just have a random conjunction. Right? You don't just say, and A. That doesn't make any sense. Right? Uh, if you're, if, let's say that A in this case stands for, it's raining, right? uh, and it's raining. Usually you're hooking that up to something else. Right? Like, it's raining and it's cloudy, or it's cloudy and it's raining. Right? Uh, so just keep the natural language in mind. If you write some statements down that don't seem like something you would say in natural language, there's a chance that there's a mistake in there. I offer this to you only as guidance, right? Again, these two things do come apart. A formal system is not meant to be natural language. But I find that if you keep in the background, right, what it is that you're actually trying to express, what it is that you're actually trying to symbolize, you'll actually find it really easy to make sure that your sentences are never ambiguous, that your symbols go where they're supposed to, right? That you never put a negation after a statement letter or that you never have a conjunction just like hanging out, right? You're always gonna need to have something on either side of that conjunction and so on and so forth. But anyway, that, that's everything that I have for you today. Just make sure that you know what the formation rules are and you should be fine when it comes to transcribing. And if you wanna watch more of uh, my logic videos, I'm trying to upload these every Tuesday and Friday. That might falter, especially since the holidays are coming up. Uh, but I'm going to try to keep this fairly regular. Uh, so stick around and I'll see you next time.